Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second portion of today's program, a panel here on changing trade alliances, opportunities, and challenges in regions across the globe. Um, I am Jill O'Donnell, the incoming director of the Eider Institute. And I'm, we're very fortunate today to have two panelists here, two women who have very broad and deep experience in international trade policy. Um, ambassador Kirsten Hillman is Canada's Deputy Ambassador to the United States, and she has more than 20 years of experience representing Canada, Canada in trade negotiations and litigation around the globe. Most recently, she was Canada's lead negotiator of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement. Ambassador Hillman has also been instrumental in Canada's outreach to the United States during the renegotiation of NAFTA. And to my right, we have Ambassador Darcy Vetter, a Nebraska native and former Chief Agricultural Negotiator at the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative. She has also held senior international trade policy and promotion positions um, at the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Senate Finance Committee. So what we're going to do today is have a conversation about many wide-ranging issues in trade policy that are happening now. And also, certainly, we welcome questions from the audience. Um, if you do have a question, question, please use the microphone for the benefit of anyone watching via live stream so that they can hear your question. So Ambassador Hillman, I will start with you today. Um, let's start talking uh, about NAFTA to begin. Uh, the primary focus of the Trump administration has been the renegotiation of NAFTA, and seven negotiating rounds have been completed so far. What is your assessment of the negotiations so far, including Canada's goals for the negotiation and any stumbling blocks that you see here. Thank you. And first of all, thank you for the question, and uh, and I'm delighted to be here. Uh, it's been a, a wonderful day and a bit so far in uh, in meeting with many many of you and and Darcy and colleagues. And I think this is a a really special event, and this institute is going to be a, a big contribution to uh, Nebraska. And, and I'm honored to be here. So with that, in answer to your question, um, so we just finished the seventh round of the negotiations uh, for NAFTA just a, a week and a bit ago. And generally speaking, I think that it's fair to say that we're, we're quite optimistic that the discussions are going well. We closed uh, a number of chapters so far, including most recently among them, the chapter on sanitary and phytosanitary measures. This is a chapter that is particularly important for anybody involved in agricultural trade and agricultural business. Um, and we're really pleased with that, uh, that chapter in that it is updating and um, reinforcing a lot of the rules that are required between our countries to make sure that agricultural and food trade happens smoothly. So the negotiations are going well and we're making, we're making progress round by round. And in your view, to follow up on this, what would you say is a realistic time frame for completion of these negotiations? You know, that's always a really hard question to answer. Um, I think that there's two factors. One is we are keen now that this modernization negotiation started to move it along as quickly as is possible so that we can ensure that our traders and our businesses are operating in a stable and predictable environment and are operating under new and modernized rules. The NAFTA is, after all, almost 25 years old. A lot has changed in 25 years and so uh, the sooner that we can get modern, effective, more efficient, uh, up-to-date rules in place, the better. But that being said, I think that it's really important that we not sacrifice um, quality for speed. And so fundamentally for Canada, what's most important is getting the deal right. And we will, we will seek to do that as quickly as we can, but our overriding um, goal will be make sure that we get an agreement that's good for all three countries. Thank you. And Ambassador Vetter, for your view now on NAFTA as well, um, what do you see as um, challenges in that negotiation? as well as maybe issues that um, are important to address now that this agreement is indeed 24 years old, 25 years old, and a lot has changed. Well, I think Ambassador Hillman said it well, that there are real opportunities to modernize NAFTA. There are a few issues that, in particular, NAFTA <coughs> didn't deal with in the same way or at all um, in the way we deal with modern trade agreements or the way that we address them in modern trade agreements. So, 
Uh, labor and environment standards, for example. When we did the NAFTA deal, we did side agreements on cooperating on labor and environmental issues, but it's been many years now since we've started including labor and environment commitments as uh, enforceable commitments inside our trade agreements. We can update that uh, with NAFTA. Uh, digital trade. We really didn't have an internet. Uh, certainly people weren't using it to conduct e-commerce 25 years ago when we were negotiating NAFTA, but an increasing portion of the business that we do as um, around the globe, not just with our NAFTA partners, is now done digitally. So we do need trade rules that allow that commerce to be conducted without barriers, that allow data flows between countries, uh, and we could up update NAFTA to do that. Ambassador Hillman already mentioned uh, food safety rules and standards uh, could be updated. So I think there is a lot of, um, a lot of work, and what I think is, is particularly interesting is that some of those same issues are issues that when we were in the negotiating process for the TPP, Mexico, Canada, and the United States were working together to address those issues on the table. And so I think there is a lot of common ground on some of those modernization issues. Uh, I do think, however, uh, that when you look at the direction overall, of uh, some of the proposals that have been offered by the United States in the NAFTA agreement. Um, some of them, frankly, have a goal that's the opposite of what we have tried to do with free trade agreements in the past. So typically, we've looked to our free trade partners and we've looked to the provisions in our free trade agreements to try and integrate markets to the deepest extent possible, to remove as many barriers as possible to trade and investment moving between the parties. Uh, but some of the elements that are currently on the table and that I think have been among the tougher issues to try and find a way forward are things like a, a sunset clause, that the United States has proposed a clause that every five years the countries would have to come together and say, you know, here are improvements we want to make, but if they can't agree on it, the agreement would automatically sunset or cease. Again, if you want to provide certainty, if you want an FTA to say, here is the conditions you're going to face today and tomorrow and the year after that. If every five years you're not certain about the terms of trade, that can have a real chilling effect on, on commerce. Um, similarly, provisions on automobile rules of origin that, you know, in the past when we looked at free trade agreements, we've said, how can we grow the pie? What's a way that we can increase economic opportunity in all of our countries and have overall opportunity increase? The United States has now introduced a proposal, and again, it's on automobile uh, rules of origin. It's not necessarily an ag proposal um, or you know, a services proposal. It is one sector. But the philosophy of that proposal is to say that we should increase the amount of each automobile or auto part that has to be uh, made in NAFTA countries to qualify for that tariff-free treatment. But beyond that, we want 50% of that to be in the United States alone. So instead of taking um, an approach that says, let's look at highlighting the three countries, it's saying we want to be able to accrue the benefits of NAFTA to individual countries uh, and sort of unwrap that, that integration or unpack that a little bit. And that's really hard to do because for 25 years we've been operating under NAFTA where many of our businesses thought of themselves as having North American operations, not operations that were Mexican or Canadian uh, or the U.S. And so these are very difficult issues to work through and um, it's a very different way of approaching what a, a trade agreement is for. So, um, you know, I think it could take quite some time to find a common approach that accrues benefits to then to all three countries and, and concluding that negotiation. Are there other opportunities you see in the context of NAFTA, the NAFTA renegotiation for the U.S.? Well, you know, again, I think those areas of modernization um, are certainly an opportunity. Uh, I think there are some untapped opportunities in discussing topics like those to also use an alliance of those countries. Uh, and frankly, something I would like to see is what is a North American approach to dealing with things like overcapacity in aluminum and steel? How do we use our allies to create a system that might um, allow us to approach jointly foreign competitors and think about how we can uh, all solve uh, those problems? So I think there are opportunities there. The question is, can we configure our negotiation and our alliance to use them? Thank you.
Um, moving on to the Trans-Pacific Partnership here, um, Ambassador Hillman, one question for you is, previously it was said that the TPP could not move forward without the United States, and yet last week um, the 11 remaining partner countries in that arrangement did sign the um, CPTPP, and so how was that agreement able to move forward without this? So I think there's a, there's a technical answer to that, and then there's sort of a, a substantive answer to that, a trade negotiating answer to that. The technical answer to that is that the Trans-Pacific Partnership as a treaty um, cannot come into force without the United States. The way in which it was crafted, it required both Japan and the United States to be party to it in order for it to come into force. Um, so that treaty remains as it is, uh, and it has not come into force. The CPTPP, which is the, the, the agreement among the 11 countries, is a standalone treaty. And it's a standalone treaty that's only a few pages long that says we, the 11 countries, adopt the provisions of the TPP with the exception of 22 uh, areas that are suspended. Um, but we adopt it as is, including all of the market access provisions in that agreement. Uh, and, and the CPTPP has a different provision for entry into force, which, only, which requires six of the 11 countries to ratify it and then it will enter into force. So the TPP as a, as a treaty is still there and conceivably could come back to life um, and enter into force if the conditions that are in that treaty are met and as I say, that would require both Japan and the United States and at least one or two other countries to ratify it. Um, that's the technical answer. How it came to be among the, uh, among the remaining parties is, is a calculation. It's an economic calculation and a political strategic, presumably in some cases, calculation that countries made to say this agreement um, even without the United States, we would have liked to have had the United States. The United States was a party to the negotiations and a central part of this initiative and their leadership. Um, but given that it's clear that uh, the, the US administration is, is not interested in um, moving forward with the TPP, the 11 other countries made an assessment. They made a national assessment and they determined that it was still worthwhile for them as 11 countries to move ahead. Um, and that's a, that's a different calculation, but they, they, they did that and, and here we are. So it was signed last week and, and now every country is moving forward to move the necessary legislation through their domestic uh, processes to bring it into force in the, in the coming months. Okay, and you as the lead negotiator for Canada for the TPP, I'd like to also link this to NAFTA. What would you say are the implications of the TPP for the NAFTA countries, and specifically as Canada and Mexico are moving forward with the CPTPP, um, how will this impact trade with the United States? Well, I mean, they're really, they're, they're two separate initiatives. So, so for us, for Canada right now, we're, we are very um, focused on the NAFTA negotiations, obviously, given the breadth and the scope of our, our trading relationship with the United States and the depth of our partnership across all areas of security and defense and cultural ties and family ties in many respects as many people here in Nebraska have told me that they have cousins or you know sisters or wives or uh, from Canada we you know that relationship is is primordial to us and the NAFTA is a, is a huge priority but at the same time uh, we are looking to diversify our markets and so for, for Canada in the Asia-Pacific, the only FTA that we have in force is with uh, South Korea. Uh, so the CPTPP provides a real opportunity for us to move into a lot of these other fast-growing markets uh, in the Asia-Pacific, and it allows us to update our, we have bilateral treaties with Chile and with Peru, and so the CPTPP is a, is a mechanism by which we've been able to update those relationships and update the rules for example, precisely in labor and in environment and in SPS and in regulatory matters and in rules of origin through the TPP, which is, which is terrific. Um, so as between Canada and the US, I, you know, it's hard to say I, whether or not there will be impacts. 
uh, we did have some economic modeling done as we were considering moving forward with, with the CPTPP. That modeling did demonstrate that there would be pressure on some U.S. imports into Canada, potentially, being displaced by some of the other uh, markets that are part of the, uh, the CPTPP. But we'll see, you know, I mean, any of us who have been involved in economic modeling around trade agreements, it is a tool uh, and it can be a, a useful tool, but the, the realities of the dynamic global marketplace are, are different and, and we'll have to see what, the, what those effects might be. Thank you. Um, taking another look at the TPP from another angle, Ambassador Vetter of the United States has, of course, pulled out of the TPP. Um, <clears throat> what do you think are the implications of this pullout for U.S. producers? Um, and without the U.S. in the TPP, do you think that um, the TPP will have enough um, economic power to act as a, as a magnet for others in the region? I think those are, are two uh, good questions. I think um, the TPP itself was, in fact, envisioned as a template for trade that would affect countries beyond the original 12. So it was a self-selected group of 12 who said, are you willing to put every product on the table? And are you willing to try and craft the highest standards when it comes to things like transparency and food safety rules and digital trade and disciplining state-owned enterprises, um, some things that had never been done before? And so we started with that group very intentionally to try to form sort of a high standard block. And then when other countries in the region saw the value of that alliance, they could accede to the block, but not change those rules. So they would have to raise their standards and what the hope was that it's normative value, that changing the way that that region does business uh, would uh, extend you know, its reach over time, in addition to opening markets, getting, getting rid of tariffs. Um, but part of the appeal was that in that original block were some really big economies, including the U.S. and Japan. And so, you know, getting access to those big economies was what would help kind of pull other countries to say it's worth it to raise your standards because the payoff is access to these big markets. And so I do think it's somewhat an open question to say without the United States, do the remaining economies have the same sort of pull? But I think it's also worth considering that if you have 11 economies in the Asia Pacific, very pretty open economies because of the market access they've been willing to put on the table, and you still have big anchor economies like Japan, um, I think even without being in the TPP, the U.S. stands to benefit somewhat if the countries in the region doing business with the TPP 11 start to modify their standards to meet um, the, the same way of doing business that, that countries do. So I do think it still has some uh, power, even if other countries don't accede to it at the same rate. It also has strategic importance. Um, part of the idea of the TPP was for the United States to really show how allied it was with some of those countries in the Asia Pacific, where we see uh, real dynamism, not only economically, these are fast growing economies, but also politically where you have a significant activity by China in the South China Sea, for example. Um, again, you know, back to my, my comment earlier about Ambassador Grocer's inability to join us today, um, foreign policy and trade policy are often sort of one and the same. And so I think that also uh, remains important. Um, on the piece about what that means for U.S. products, uh, I come at these negotiations from an agricultural perspective, of course, that was my role, to, to help negotiate the ag provisions. And I see a loss of competitiveness with the United States being out of that agreement. Uh, if you think about the Japanese market, for example, um, TPP had around the table a number of our competitors, including Canada, <laughs> who will now have access to the Japanese market for pork, for dairy, for wine. Uh, growing high-value markets, but Australia, New Zealand, Canada, all big exporters uh, of those products. And so now we've taken ourselves out of that, uh, those gains in, in market access. Um, so with Canada, I think we see, if you just think about NAFTA and TPP, that overlap, Canada will now have access to TPP countries um, that we don't have and are competitors in many areas. When I think about Mexico, they are becoming an exporter of pork, we heard over lunch, but they are also the main sort of export market for many of our, our, our agricultural commodities. And when they open 
to TPP countries, we'll have new competition in that space. So more opportunity for Australia and New Zealand to send their dairy products uh, to Mexico, for example. Uh, so you know, I think it does change the competitive position to have the TPP go forward without us. Okay, thank you. Um, another question on NAFTA, Ambassador Hillman. Um, one of the US's NAFTA proposals would, in essence, make dispute settlement provisions within NAFTA voluntary rather than binding. Um, what do you think the impact of a more voluntary system and dispute settlement would be on the NAFTA or on global trade rules more generally? Thank you. Um, so maybe I'll answer that question by picking up something uh, that Darcy was saying earlier. You know, I like to say the trade agreements really do two things. They open up markets to the partners that are around the table in, in the trade agreement. They provide market access, uh, often at preferential, in pre under preferential terms. And they do that in order to encourage integration, encourage business alliances, encourage partnerships, and encourage supply chains. So that we, again, as Darcy was saying, sort of raise both sides of the equation up. So they open markets. But the other thing that they do, which I think is sometimes almost more important, is they provide stability. They set out rules that governments commit to internationally so that as governments change, as they do in all of our countries, those rules remain transcending over domestic political changes. And the reason I'm focusing on that is that that stability aspect of, of not only trade agreements but any international commitment is fundamentally valuable if you can rely on it, if it is abided by, which requires you to be able to enforce it. And I think that the, the value of dispute settlement in a trade agreement is that the countries know we have negotiated these commitments, we are sticking to these commitments, and we are willing to be bound by them and have our actions judged by independent third parties. Um, so if you take that piece away, then one of the core benefits of an international trade agreement, and one of the reasons that countries do make concessions in a trade agreement, is lost. And I think you diminish the willingness of parties to come to the table and make difficult decisions if they can't be sure that what they're getting in return, the stability and the market openness, will be something that can be enforced over time. So you mentioned the integration of supply chains there, and I want to consider that for just a moment. Um, just today I saw a headline that warned of trade tensions, um, trade war tensions, um, and there's certainly a lot of attention on all these varying trade issues today. Um, how likely do you think that is to happen? I'd like to ask both of you to respond to this one. And do you think that the integration of global supply chains and how that has increased over time could be a buffer against protectionism in this environment? Well, I think that the integration of supply chains, I think that the globalization of our economy, I think that the, the, the relationships that Canadian businesses have made with American businesses, that Canadian people have made with American people through their, their economic relationships, and, and, and not to mention relationships that they have built in other countries all over the world, they are there, and they represent the reality of the way business is done today. Just like e-commerce represents the reality of the way business is done today. That in and of itself, I don't think you can roll back the clock. I think that that is going to be maintained. But what I think happens in, in, in a moment, in these moments of potential uncertainty, is that um, people are less willing and businesses are less willing to take chances. They're less willing to go out and start fresh relationships. They're less willing to make investments. They're less willing to uh, put, make decisions that could be risky because of the uncertain environment in which they're operating. And so I have no doubt that we will continue to move forward in our, for example, bilateral relationship economically with the United States or with any other country for that matter. But what I think it can be lost um, in times of uncertainty is the forward momentum. 
I think that com people and companies and businesses and individuals become inherently more conservative. And then that, that becomes opportunities lost. And maybe just to close by on, on this topic by saying, I think that is a shame because I do believe that the North American economic space if it becomes stronger, more integrated, more mutually supportive, more innovative, more open, we'll be more competitive. And I think that at this point in history, in, in global uh, economic environment, and we heard this from Kira's presentation just moments ago, we need to be putting our very best foot forward as a group of countries, to be upping our game as much as we can, and to be as you know innovative and forward-looking as we can be. And as a, as a government official, I definitely see that as my responsibility towards my population, is to find ways to have us be the best that we can be. And I think that, that we can do that much, much better if we're working together. Thank you. Ambassador Vetter? Well, I think um, certainly you can't really open up the newspaper or your Twitter feed or whatever it is without um, seeing the words trade war being thrown around. And a lot of that uh, relates specifically to the announcement in the last week or so that the administration would impose <coughs> excuse me, tariffs on steel and aluminum. And you know, I do think there is a threat there that once action is taken, on particularly on critical inputs that have um, that we really rely on a number of foreign suppliers for, um, you start to see sort of three effects. Um, one is, of course, that prices go up on those commodities, and those are big inputs that help to fuel the rest of the economy. So, just this morning, in talking to farmers, I heard that the price of rebar has gone up twice since the announcement of those tariffs, and they've not yet even been implemented. So that is, uh, that's a, a key point, that it does have ripple effects throughout the economy. The second is the piece that Kira was asked about and talked about at lunch, which is the retaliatory effect. If we begin to place tariffs on inputs that come from key trading partners, then what tariffs might they put on our exports uh, in retaliation for that? And how far will that retaliatory behavior stretch? So the, t the steel and tariff, uh, steel and aluminum tariff decision in and of itself will have an economic impact, but that impact could be somewhat limited if that begins to, to have carry-on effects and other countries respond in kind in, with agricultural products or other industrial goods or even with uh, new barriers on services, then the economic impact of that can, uh, can really start to add up quickly. Um, the third aspect of this, and you didn't ask me about it sort of specifically, but it's the criteria under which these tariffs were applied, and that is the test of whether uh, the decision announced that these tariffs were being put in place because they are a matter of national security. Uh, and that is um, a pretty interesting test. Under, If you look at the, the rules at the, the World Trade Organization, um, countries can impose barriers when it is really a matter of clear international security. But that has seldom been used, and it is written sort of as a self-executing rule, a self-judging rule. Um, who is to say to another country, yes, it is a matter of security, or, or no, it isn't. Uh, and so it is hard to challenge. And so that creates a real test for the system itself that once it is utilized, and if it appears that it is utilized in a situation where maybe security is not uh, the underlying motivation, or there's curiosity about how dire that security system is, does it, or that security test is, does it create temptation for others to say, well, in this case, where I face some hard opposition, is it a security issue? And for agriculture, I watch this closely because India, for example, has been arguing for years that as a matter of food security, it should not have to meet uh, its WTO commitments uh, on subsidies or on reducing tariffs. And so, um, you know, policy decisions are important and have follow-on effects, and other countries may emulate what we do um, for the impact they have themselves, but also for saying, how does this decision fit into the overall system, and how do we value uh, that, that global system, and how do we want to encourage others 
to meet that commitment and uh, provide the stability that Ambassador Hillman was talking to us about. So, you know, I think in, in sort of one or two short weeks, <laughs> big conversations about uh, how our system works and how this will play out uh, have certainly uh, erupted and will continue. Thank you. So on the issue of the steel and aluminum tariffs that, that were announced, um, Ambassador Hillman, the president also announced that Canada and Mexico would be exempt from these tariffs um, for a period of time so that NAFTA renegotiations could be finished. Um, does Canada view these two issues of steel and aluminum tariffs and the NAFTA renegotiations as linked? So the, the announcement with respect to the steel and the aluminum tariffs, as Ambassador Vetter has said, is based on a provision of, of U.S. law that allows them to be put in place for national security purposes. Um, Canada is a NATO ally of the United States. We're a NORAD partner with the United States. And in fact, under U.S. law, we are part of your defense industrial base, which means that we are essentially the, the same as you when it comes to supplying your defense industry for the products that they need in order to manufacture your, uh, to serve your manufacturing needs in the defense sector. So there is no way by which Canada could pose a national security threat to the United States and indeed it's quite the, quite the opposite. We are your closest ally and, and most valued. I believe, national security partner. So in that respect, the, the tariffs not applying to Canada seems perfectly logical and reasonable uh, to us. Um, and that's, what they're, that's the way in which they were invoked. The NAFTA is a different story, and we really don't see the two issues as linked at all. The NAFTA negotiations are negotiations that we're participating in um, constructively and uh, fully and we will continue to do that. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Vetter, I'd like to ask you about bilateral negotiations versus multilateral or regional deals. Um, President Trump has often said that he believes the United States loses important leverage if, if negotiations are undertaken on a multi-party basis, and preferring instead to negotiate deals on a bilateral basis. Do you agree with that assessment, or how would you assess that? I don't agree with that assessment, but I think um, certainly if you're doing a deal bilaterally, one country and one country together, you have a certain amount of, of trade-offs, you have a lot of leverage if one party walks away, the, the deal uh, is eliminated, but you also only have as many trade-offs as are possible with two parties. Um, sometimes when you have more parties, you can actually create a whole other system, or in exchange for one trade-off, you might get access to five markets and not one. Um, as I noted earlier in the discussion of TPP, you had a coalition of 12 countries who were very willing to put a lot of things on the table. And so in exchange for individual sacrifices, you had a multiplier effect of the access you might get or the rules that other countries would follow. And so in that case, particularly for a large economy like the United States, we had a great deal of leverage in shaping what that agreement looked like, and then, of course, in getting access to, to multiple markets. So this plurilateral approach, or this regional approach, I think offers more opportunities for trade-offs with a bigger outcome and bigger benefit than bilaterals sometimes do. But I do think that President Trump has a point when you talk about multilateral deals. And the problem is multilateral and plurilateral and bilateral, all these terms sort of get mushed together. But in trade land, when we talk about a multilateral approach, we're often talking about the WTO. And that is a consensus-based body. So everyone has to be on board before a decision is made and the gavel comes down. And it's more than 160 countries. So if you look at the trade deals we've done multilaterally with that many countries, you negotiate very hard to get every country to do what they absolutely can, but to get it across the finish line, you do kind of end up with the lowest common denominator. And so our free trade agreements that we've done with individual countries or regionally with Central America, for example, have typically had higher standards and better trade liberalization or faster and deeper cuts in tariffs than we were able to achieve at the WTO. The benefit of the WTO, of course, is that all countries are in it together, and so the cumulative benefit is still large. So it's sort of a, a roundabout way of saying 
no, I don't think a bilateral deal is always the best option. Sometimes that's the way it presents itself. That in fact these regional deals can provide uh, real significant access and in some ways deeper access than a bilateral deal could. Um, but even if a multilateral package doesn't get you as far or as fast, um, it's still of great value because it is applied globally. So all of those tools, I think, should be pursued and we shouldn't be taking any of them out of the toolbox um, simply by, uh, because of their structure. So sticking with another change in approach to trade policy, Ambassador Vetter, the Trump administration has been focused on the trade balance. Um, and correcting bilateral trade deficits as a primary goal in trade policy. What would you say are the implications of such an approach? Well, first of all, and you know, I'm certainly not the first to say it, I think um, we entered a time in the past couple of years where we started talking about the language of trade and what it means for the U.S. economy has changed into a more binary kind of language. Are we winning or are we losing? Uh, at trade. And that's not just President Trump. I think we saw it on both sides of the aisle uh, through the presidential campaign. Um, but I think that's a really reductionist way to look at trade in general and to try to describe what's happening for businesses who are living in a, a global economy. And, you know, often um, the, the president points to the fact that we have a trade deficit with Mexico to say that that relationship is somehow unfair or that we are losing at trade with Mexico. Um, but to say that the, the value of our trade with one country is judged simply by looking at what goods cross the border and in what number, um, I, I, don't, I don't think it's a good yardstick. Uh, first of all, Mexico has about 150 million consumers and we have far more. So it would be hard for them to buy as much from us <laughs> as we buy from them. Uh, but second, judging our relationship in that way completely leaves out the fact that there are businesses and, and producers of all sorts in the United States who might import an, an, a product from Mexico, transform it, use that product as an input into something else, make an entirely different product, thereby employing Americans and adding jobs to our economy, and export it to a third country <laughs> where that helps our trade balance with that country, but we're still negative, so to speak, with Mexico. And that's really how our economy works, as things flow from one country to another. It might go back and forth to Mexico several times before it becomes the finished good. And so where that good stops is not necessarily, that's how it's accounted for in our math, but it's not a very good measure of the value that it adds uh, to our producers and our communities. So thank you, Ambassador Better, Ambassador Hillman, do you see a need to update the way that we account for um, trade flows and calculate trade balances? Yes, I think, I think that there is a need to, to update it, and I think it's a difficult thing for us to do. We've spent a lot of time uh, domestically, but also with, with other partners, uh, including at the OECD, for example, trying to catch the, catch the value or calculate the value of services trade in our economy. So services trade um, actually represents the majority of the uh, a larger component of our GDP than goods trade within Canada. And, yet, and it's the fastest growing area of our economy as well. And yet we are not really very sophisticated at calculating the um, benefit of the services industry to our economy. It's something that we need to be thinking about. And it's also, I think, uh, to Ambassador Vetter's point, being able to calculate value added in goods when they move back and forth across the border. And, and that may be, you know, part of one of the things that I think is interesting about this point in time, and this has certainly been highlighted here in Nebraska, is the, is the need that we have to communicate more broadly and more deeply with our communities and our societies around what international trade actually means in the lives of our people. And in order to do that, we would be better off if we had the right kind of data, the right kind of information to bring to the table to demonstrate to people. We're working on it. I think other governments are working on it as well, but it is certainly an area for, for future work. Thank you. Let me just expand on that a little bit. Um, this brings me to a question on the adjustment costs that are sometimes brought up in the context of trade. Um, and associated with, with free trade. So when we talk about trade with people who work in import competing industries, 
who may have seen their jobs go away and um, point to free trade as the reason for that, how should we talk about trade policy in that context and how can we shape it so that the benefits are broadly shared and everyone is prepared for potential impacts? Well, I, I think that it's true and it's clear that with, and I wouldn't say as a result of free trade agreements, but as a result of the shifting globalization of our economy in the last 20 years, uh, the benefits of that globalization have not been equally shared throughout our societies and throughout the sectors of our economy. That is true in Canada, that is true in the US, that's true in Europe. And that's part of the reason why we are, we are experiencing frustration and, and concern in certain parts of our societies. So as a government official, as a public policy maker, um, I and, and my government and our leadership and our minister and our prime minister are all acutely aware of this reality and looking at various ways to address it. One way to address it is getting information out, as I mentioned. Another way to address it is ensuring that we have policies outside of the trade agreements that provide for um, our citizens and our societies to be able to evolve with the changing needs of the workforce. And what's happened in the last 20 years is nothing compared to what we're going to see in the next 20 years. So with the, you know, with the oncoming changes in our economy with artificial intelligence and mechanization even more so, uh, we're going to need to really up our game in those areas. And, and so our government's thinking a lot about that with its, its innovation agenda. But back to the trade agreement. Um, Again, when, our, when, the, when Prime Minister Trudeau's government came in a couple of years ago, uh, there had just been Brexit. There was a lot of talk in the United States on both sides, as, as Ambassador Vetter had said, uh, around concerns around free trade and free trade agreements. And our government very much took this to heart and thought, you know, it's clear that even in Canada, where we do have a fairly strong consensus around trade, but even there, there are parts of the economy that were feeling like they were left behind, that they really weren't represented in this aspect of public policy making. And so we spent a lot of time crossing the country, talking to different groups, and putting together um, proposals within our free trade agreements with the European Union, um, in NAFTA, in, in other agreements that we're moving forward with that would seek to address that. So part of that is strong labor and strong environment chapters, um, building on what we've done but trying to buttress it even more. Part of that is one of the, one of the realities in, in Canada that I was, I was talking earlier about was how we have, um, for some reason, when we look at small and medium-sized enterprises, those that are headed by women are significantly less likely to enter the export market. And if they don't enter the export market, they're significantly less likely to uh, grow and to become larger companies that were bigger employers and more profitable and contributing more to our economic uh, prosperity. So we've looked at things like that and, and both within the trade agreement and outside of the trade agreement are trying to find ways to make sure that other segments of, of Canadian society that maybe haven't quite reaped the benefits of uh, trade agreements are doing so. Thank you. Ambassador Vetter, what is your view on this question of adjustment costs and how we talk about trade and maybe better communicate about it? Well, I think, um, I think Kirsten is right in that we, um, the global economy has not affected every sector the same. There are certain sectors in the United States and in other countries that have had more or less success dealing with more global competition. Uh, but I think, you know, I view trade policy as having sort of two parts. And I have built um, my career and experience around the part where the government say, what are the terms of trade? What is it going to look like when you try to send your product in or out? What's the tariff going to be? What are the general rules? The other part of that is what do countries do to then help individuals access that system? How do they know what those rules are? How are they prepared to use those rules? How are they prepared for the additional product or competition that might come forward? And that's where I think we have really fallen down on the job um, in the United States. And, and frankly, we're not completely alone. But you could anticipate with the increased 
pace of um, automation and productivity, uh, you know, manufacturing jobs have been on the decline simply because it doesn't take very many people to make the same amount or more product than it did many years ago. So if we knew that was coming, what did we do to our resource base? And by that I mean the human capital that we once required to make those widgets. How are we going to use them productively or anticipate that they will need lifelong learning to continue to adjust and provide, um, figure out how they plug into this global economy so that they can provide for their families, that they can have you know, productive and rewarding careers. And we just haven't done a good job of investing in a systematic and consistent way in one of our biggest resources in human capital. And so you have people who feel very much left behind by this global system. And you know, frankly, I will say that some of this language about uh, trade and, and were we winning or were we losing, I had hoped that where that would lead was to a bit more of that focus on those who maybe haven't been more competitive. And so I frankly have been a little bit disappointed that our sort of conversation here in the United States has continued to focus on that relationship outside instead of saying, well, wait a second, we actually have a lot to offer here inside. Are we developing it and are we deploying it well? Um, so I still remain somewhat hopeful that we can return some of that focus to helping uh, our own uh, human resources take advantage of the global economy. So in that context, do you think that the, the current conversation and debate about the benefits of trade is unique or how have countries dealt with these types of concerns in the past and, and why, why does this seem to be particularly amplified now? Well, I, I don't think it's unique. I think it's been going on for a long time. Sort of as long as there has been globalization, I think there has been a debate about whether is it good or is it bad? Um, should we look at our economies as, as a unit or should we think about ourselves as being interconnected? Uh, I don't think that's a new debate. I think that the, the political climate is sort of taking advantage and feeding off of that debate in a way that may not be putting our attention in the place that actually solves the problem. Uh, and I am um, I'm concerned about that, but I don't think the debate itself uh, is a unique one. My concern, however, um, about how this debate is playing itself out in the United States is that while we've had the debate for a long time, we didn't have the debate at the expense of continuing to engage internationally. And I fear we're sort of reaching a point where the debate itself about how we handle things internally, how we look at our um, assets as a country, are we're having that debate and pulling ourselves out of the larger global conversation um, by not pursuing new trade agreements or not having enough of an outward facing agenda while we re-examine the current relationships that we have. And I think in the past we've managed to have that debate, but also have one foot in the global conversation at the same time. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Hillman, um, would you say that the institutions of global economic governance, such as the GATT, now WTO, that were put in place after World War II and have served the world pretty well, uh, would you say they're now under stress or that they were not designed to handle some of the pressures they're currently facing? And if so, what could be done about that? Um, I mean, I don't know if they're under stress any more than they have been from time to time. I think that they're, fundamentally, these organizations are made up of groups of countries and people and individuals and the, and the objectives and goals of their governments. And so I think that um, it is important within those organizations to find leadership um, and maybe what we're looking at right now is is a moment where in different contexts leadership is um, is is something that is is emerging or changing and so we will need those organizations and I don't think there's any any one who any country that will um, want to walk away from what we have accomplished there. Uh, I just think we're maybe in a moment of a bit of a, a bit of a bit of tension. Um, but 
as I say, humans being what they are and governments uh, being what they are, I think this, this time will pass. It's, it's a reflection of, of a global economy and a global political environment where there's a lot going on and there's a lot of co complicated dynamics, both politically and from a security perspective and from an economic perspective, and it's all happening at the same time. And so perhaps there's some stress, but that stress is probably inevitable and it will lead to um, coalitions of leadership emerging and I'm, I'm confident it'll take us forward. Thank you. Ambassador Better, do you have a view on this one as well? Uh, no, I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, certainly I think some of the questions about the global system and, and the rules and how they're enforced uh, are maybe a bit louder than they have been. Um, but, you know, I hope that they they will sort of stand the, the test and, and the, the need for them to provide that stability will also be uh, articulated as well. Um, you know, I, I would say I'm not less optimistic maybe <laughs> in Kirsten, but I might say that the threat is a bit, uh, is a bit more. Uh, and I think part of that is um, that really since World War II and the particular political circumstances that came out of um, that point in time, the United States has always been sort of the biggest champion of that rules-based trading system. And I can say personally as a U.S. negotiator, you always understood that you were in the room at whatever ungodly hour it might be trying to forge consensus out of what seemed like disarray, that uh, quitting wasn't an option because you were there negotiating certainly on behalf of the, in the interest of the United States, but it was always understood too that the United States was also negotiating on behalf of the system. That U.S. leadership was necessary and important and a role that we wanted to play. And so it wasn't the case that at the 11th hour, the United States couldn't be the one to get up and walk out of the room at, at the WTO or in these negotiations we had to stay until we at least found a way forward, as modest as the gains might be, um, because having an outcome from these international institutions was important. And so um, part of the debate about whether we should be subject to those rules or if those rules themselves provide some of that stability and um, a driver in our economy and you know, therefore is it important for us to support them, I, I believe the answer is an obvious yes, but the fact that the United States is debating it, I think has some consequence because others expect us to be sort of keepers of the system. And if we aren't playing that role, that changes things. So I, you know, I hope that we can, can recognize and sort of carry that role going forward because I do think it's important. Thank you. We do have time for questions. And again, please wait for the mic if you do have a question so those watching via live stream can hear you. So this is an interesting topic and thank you for your input. Um, when I think about global trade, and I, I'm, I don't do trade really, but I've been involved in agriculture and genetically engineered crops and things like that. Clearly that takes partnerships and discussions and I was at the Codex meeting in 2001 that was kind of instrumental in getting food safety agreement and the US and Canada were major drivers there. Um, if the system is changing dramatically, how will that affect things like, not just genetically engineered crops, which is a big thing for the United States, certainly, and also for Canada, but food safety and environmental policy and things like that. I mean, it's bigger than just how many potatoes did you sell or how many dollars. So do you have any perspective on that? Maybe I'll, I'll answer briefly and then I'll, I'll let uh, your former chief ag negotiator weigh in. <laughs> um, 
I think that now more than ever, it's important for us to be working together, uh, not only Canada and the United States, but countries that are like-minded in ensuring that our agricultural resources are as healthy and safe as well as productive as possible. Uh, it's very important for us to be working together because uh, one, the world is going to need those technologies and our foods. Two, there is so much sort of disruption that can happen internationally when trying to trade in heavily regulated areas, and food is a very heavily regulated area. So the more that we can smooth out um, those potential def technical difficulties through building a common scientific and regulatory understanding, the better we are. Um, and I think that we've done good work in that respect, but that is always going to be a challenge as we seek to move products you know, around the world, as we seek to enter into new markets that we're less used to operating in. I mean, one of the reasons that the Canada-US-Mexico trading relationship is so smooth and prosperous is because we're used to dealing with each other. We've been doing it for years and years and years, and so we have a common culture uh, a regulatory culture, we have common scientific approaches, We, but that didn't happen you know, by accident, that happened by hard work and by common purpose and common objectives. And so as you move forward into other markets that don't have the same uh, depth and of, of relationship or don't have the same regulatory culture or may not even have the same um, kind of standards in place, it becomes more complicated. I think that's extremely well said. I think um, from an ag perspective, more and more food and more and more varieties of that food coming from an increasing number of countries is moving around the globe. So, you know, trade in ag and ag products has grown, you know, it's almost an exponential curve if you look at the past uh, 25 or 30 years. And so assurances that we can provide one another that that's going to be safe, high quality, nutritious food is important. And just as important is certainty about what's going to happen to it when it hits the border. And in agriculture, I think facilitating either by developing standards in common about, you know, an agreed level that scientists from around the world have had input into of you know residues that are safe or of methods that you can use to deal with pests or contaminants or you know a common purpose there is important so that any regulator in any country who adopted those standards could feel like they were genuinely protecting uh, their citizens and so that is important and you know Equally, those standard setting bodies, the Codex or the Plant Protection Convention that sort of bring those experts together to develop those common standards. So, you know, if you're a farmer or a food processor and you meet one standard, then your product should be able to go a lot of places. Those standard setting bodies have been recognized by the WTO. So you know that if you as a country adopt those standards, you're gonna be in compliance with trade rules. Those things are, are related. Um, similarly, we can use the WTO and other trade institutions to build trade capacity. And you know, we oftentimes complain about the trade barriers and SPS rules that are too onerous. But in many countries, those rules are in some ways onerous because they don't have the cadre of scientists that can perform risk assessments and put in place a more nuanced rule. If you don't really know what the risk is, sometimes the easiest thing is just to ban it because then you can you know, cover yourself and say, I didn't let in this product that has potential implications. But we can use the training system to build that capacity and it, either the capacity to assess risk or the capacity to process products through borders. If you're shipping fresh fruits and vegetables and you ship it to a country where the average wait time at the border is two days versus two weeks, the amount of risk and the amount of value you have left in your product at the end is an entirely different proposition as to whether you can can engage in that trade. So, um, you know, yes, I think our trading system, our food safety system, and you know, are absolutely inextricably linked, and that can be to very good effect. But we have to be strategic about it, and we have to find ways to get as many countries as possible around the table and participating 
because a number of those bottlenecks are often uh, in countries that one desperately need those calories and more choices for their citizens, but have limited capacity to, to deliver it. There's one right up here. Hi, how are you? Uh, my name is Harry. Thank you so much for the uh, discussion, and uh, it was really helpful. Um, I'm an exporter uh, here, domestic here in, in Nebraska, uh, where I also are further processors. Uh, my question's a uh, little bit more technical and specific. Um, so, uh, uh, in lines of TPP, we were uh, my my friend has invested very heavily in Vietnam as a, a very high. Uh, gross, um, it, it's a high growing mar uh, market for us. And um, however, TPP is dead. So um, we were actively um, um, discuss and uh, find out the possibility to open up the ranch in Canada and take advantage of NAFTA to basically buy ma raw material here, domestically here in Nebraska and Midwestern region, and do a further processing plant somewhere in Saskatchewan or. Calgary, and then re-export it to Vietnam. But if the if the NAFTA is in lingo, and we're not really sure about what the future gonna hold, um, so our firm gonna reevaluate the strategy. So my question would be, um, uh, as an exporter and manufacturer, as policymaker, what do you think about the NAFTA negotiation for the specifically in terms of ag par? especially involving beef and pork trading between Canada and the United States. Do you think the current administration will have some tariff and uh, obstruction in between? Um, so that's my question. Thank you. So, well, I think we can each offer our perspective on, on what we think. Um, personally, I think even though the process itself could be lengthy, I believe that at the end of the day, we will end up with, uh, with a NAFTA that, that works. And if you look at agriculture, none of the three parties are suggesting that we would reimpose tariffs or barriers on agricultural products. I think the, the threat in the NAFTA process for U.S. agriculture is uh, perhaps a retaliatory one if negotiations go in a negative direction. And it's the cost of uncertainty in the negotiations themselves. So the longer these negotiations drag on and the more uncertain the outcome is, the more I am likely, if I am a buyer of U.S. products in Mexico, for example, to say, well, you know, I'm just going to get a portion of that corn from Brazil. And maybe I'm going to start buying a portion of my wheat from Argentina or my apples from Chile because diversifying is a way for me to manage the risk that this doesn't turn out well or that there's some change that will happen over time. So the process itself does matter. I do, however, believe that at the end of the day, we will wind up with free trade in our ag products, particularly pork and beef, uh, among the, the NAFTA parties. Um, but I think your example is an excellent cautionary tale <laughs> in that by taking ourselves out of the TPP, the jobs that you would have provided in the United States to further process your goods are now going to be manufactured in Canada to be able to export them to a fellow TPP country. And that is the nature of business. You have a product that you can create and that you believe you can sell, so you have to find the vantage point to do so. Um, and so, you know, I think that's precisely the kind of example that um, we're concerned about if we don't create that access from within the United States will that further processing go somewhere else? Yes, there were some big <laughs> there were some big gains on the table. <laughs> Okay. Another question, yes. Uh, two, two quick questions. One is, first, what impact is the TPP legal text having on NAFTA 
renegotiations because TPP is sort of the most recent gold standard uh, text. And the second question is, if the U.S. said in a year, we want back in TPP, what would be the, the hurdles or issues? What would happen with the provisions the 11 suspended? And would the 11 be open to additional changes uh, in the TPP? Okay. Um, so with respect to looking to some of the text that was negotiated in the TPP and the NAFTA, um, actually we're looking at different texts. So, so trade agreement texts are, they evolve from one instrument to the other, right? And both, all, all three countries, Canada, US, and Mexico, have different examples of recent trade agreements. So we just concluded uh, our free trade agreement with the European Union, um, and obviously we concluded the TPP. Uh, Mexico is heavily uh, involved in, a, in a, an organization in the region called the Pacific Alliance. Um, so these are all instruments that are looked at when we are trying to provide examples uh, on how to update the NAFTA. But fundamentally, what's important to remember is that we're working off of the NAFTA text, right? The NAFTA exists. So for any provision, that, any section that already exists, that's what we are, we are looking to. Uh, for brand new chapters that didn't exist when the NAFTA was created, but have, have sprung up in other agreements, then each country sort of brings to the table um, examples that they think are, are important and, and high standard. Um, on the question of, maybe could you reiterate your, question, your second question? If the U.S. said in a year we want to get back into TPP, um, what would be some of the issues or hurdles to overcome? Would the sus provisions that were suspended amongst the 11 be unsuspended and what additional changes might the 11 be open to to get the U.S. US back in? You know, I don't think that's a question that is even answerable at this point in time, to be honest. Uh, uh, the, the CPTPP exists, as I said, uh, and it's, it's very much open to accession by other countries. And my understanding is that there are actually a few countries who have already expressed to some members of the, of the group that they would like to start talking. Um, so it's there to be acceded to uh, according to a pretty simple provision, which is you sign up to the agreement, which includes the suspended provisions. Um, but beyond that, I, as I say, I think it's, it's really impossible to say at this point. I think we have time for about one more question. I see one way back here. Hi. Um, my question is related with, uh, you've been talking about commercial products and going back and forth and tariffs. Um, how about uh, labor? Uh, there are many uh, visas that are given to people from Mexico to come and work in the United States, like the TN or uh, nurses, for example, in the USA, there is a, a big deficit. Uh, and, and Canada can uh, allow, uh, the USA allow a lot of people from Canada to come and work as a nurses uh, under the NAFTA. So um, have you guys seen those part of the, uh, uh, those clauses of the, of the NAFTA treaty and how is that going to affect, uh, if you can give some insight about that? Sure. Um, so traditionally in a trade agreement in the NAFTA is no different. We deal with um, provisions on facilitating labor mobility for temporary um, professional workers, okay? So there's different categories of visas in all of our countries. And there, is, there are generally, in, I can speak to Canada. So in Canada, we have certain kinds of visas for seasonal or low skilled workers. We have certain kinds of visas that, that lead to actual immigration. And then we have temporary visas that allow somebody to come into the country on a short-term basis for certain very specified reasons, okay? And this is not because we have a shortage of nurses in Canada. That's a different program. What's dealt with in a trade agreement is 
a, by the way, I don't know if we have a shortage of nurses in Canada, I just said that. <laughs> so if you have nurses in your family, I'm not sure that that's a, that that's a thing. Um, what, what we deal with in trade agreements are, is the recognition that when we are opening up our, in, our countries to further investment uh, or further service trade, that sometimes you're going to need somebody to go from your country into the country, so let, let's say there's been a U.S. investment in Canada to um, start up a, or to, to build a bridge, okay? Um, and you have engineers from the United States who are in charge for that company of the oversight of that project. And you need to be able to get your engineers from your headquarters temporarily relocated for the oversight of that project. There's a special kind of visa that is allowed for that. And in the trade agreements, traditionally what we do is we try to uh, facilitate the movement of people for the provision of these kinds of services. So it's not a long-term thing, and it's, not, it's for the very specific purpose of being able to operationalize investment and services commitments that we have made in each other's markets. That is the very narrow degree to which we deal with labor mobility in a trade agreement. But having said that, one thing that's absolutely true is that the, the, the NAFTA, given the age that it is, um, elaborates different categories of professions where we feel that we, we the three countries felt that we needed to have expedited uh, and simplified procedures for the movement of, of these business professionals. And th that list of categories is woefully out of date. And the most obvious example of that is in the, in the information technology sector, the IT sector. The categorization, if I'm not mistaken, and there's one category only that we have under the NAFTA, is computer scientist. So if you think about the thousands of different kinds of IT professionals that may be crossing our borders all the time in order to provide support for their company for an investment that it's made or for some, some, some additional operations that it's opening. Computer scientist is not going to do the trick. So it's, it's really important for us in the context of the NAFTA negotiations to update those lists to make sure that they represent the reality of the workforce and the, and the, and the work today. And maybe to think about how we're going to make them relevant as we've been saying a few times here this afternoon, how we expect our uh, economy and the kinds of jobs that are in our economy to evolve quite rapidly over the next little while. Thank you. That brings us to the end of this portion of our day. Um, please join me in thanking Ambassador Hillman and Ambassador Vetter for a very informative conversation. Thank you.